Welcome to Maison Mission. I'm Miranda, and thank you for being a part of our group's program this week. Maison is a Greek word that means greater. Maison Mission is all about creating greater spaces for people to hear and experience the good news of Jesus. We are quickly approaching the end of our group cycle. Next week, we'll have Maison Live, and then the following week, it's Mother's Day, and we'll not be having a program that week. Our last group's meeting will be on May 21st, so make sure you mark your calendars, and we hope to see you as we conclude our year together. If you're watching our program this morning, we want to remind you that today is the last day of our candy collection for teacher appreciation at Stephen Foster Elementary. If you have any candy to donate, please make sure we get it today by 5 p.m. so we can encourage the teachers and staff there with some candy bouquets. Today, we join our pastor, Kevin Brusher, as we continue in our teaching series called For God So Loved. We've all seen the pictures of people holding up the John 316 signs at sporting events. It's almost iconic at this point. I think even our own Tim Tebow was famously seen with John 316 etched into his face paint. The verse is found on t-shirts and keychains and posters. John 316 has somehow worked its way into being one of the most, if not the most, memorable and popular Bible verses in modern culture. But why? Let me introduce you to Rockin' Rollin' Stewart, also known as the Rainbow Man, as seen here. He was also known for wearing a giant rainbow afro wig. A little backstory on Stewart. He was quoted as saying that he was the most famous person you've never met. Hmm. He was obsessed with getting famous by being on television. After converting to Christianity during the Jesus People movement of the 70s, Stewart started appearing at sporting events in 1977 with signs saying John 316 and Jesus saves. He would strategically place himself in the line of sight of the cameras so that he could be seen in the background. He was basically the grandfather of the modern photobomb, an opportunist that hijacked the airwaves with the purpose of evangelizing people. He showed up at basketball games, baseball games, even the Olympics. He was extreme a zealot of sorts. He would protest events he felt were against God's will. One time, he even carried out a stink bomb attack on the American Music Awards to show the people that God thinks this stinks. His intense public persona finally reached its full form in 1992 when he was arrested for kidnapping and reckless endangerment. He threatened to shoot at airplanes taking off from LAX after kidnapping a housekeeper in a, home, in a motel, all because he believed that the rapture would happen in like six days. He's currently serving three consecutive life sentences. Tough break. I just found this story so fascinating. Even though Rock and Roll and Stewart found his 15 minutes of fame and faded out of the public sphere, the baton of John 316 and Jesus Saves seems to have been passed on as hundreds of imitators have hit the scenes of sporting events and news stories. It seems that one thing is for sure, Rollin Stewart definitely helped to solidify this verse into our popular culture. John 316 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Kind of an interesting verse to lead off evangelizing with. Depending on your perspective, it can seem hopeful, helpful, even compelling. God loves you so much that he would give his only child to this world, and if you believe in him, you will have eternal life, or after this life, you'll live on. Nice thoughts. But I want to take a few minutes and unpack this passage in its context, because as our friend Anigo Montoya says in The Princess Bride, you keep saying this word. I do not think it means what you think it means. As we look back on last week, Susie told us a little bit of the backstory already. 
Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin, an elite group of religious leaders at the time, probably the most elite. These guys were enacting policies and interpreting the laws for the people to follow. So when Nicodemus visits Jesus, Nick already knew that the people he associated with were not fans of Jesus' work. Jesus was disrupting the order of things, the interpretation of the rules that they had worked so hard to use and keep people in line. You see, it's always about control, isn't it? We want people to follow the rules because we want to feel a sense of order and control. And it was no different for the Pharisees and the religious leaders back then. They saw themselves as gatekeepers, the ruling elite, like a caste system. They were above others so that they could keep their power and influence and make sure that others stayed in their lanes. So this conversation with Jesus is significant for several reasons. I like to think of Nicodemus as one of the OG deconstructionists. I mean, he had questions. My theory on Nick is that he was surrounded by these powerful leaders who were threatened by the power and popularity of Jesus, but he himself could see that there was something bigger going on, something that was challenging him to maybe rethink his beliefs. Maybe our buddy Nick here recognized that Jesus could actually be who some were saying that he was. Could he truly be the Messiah that they had been waiting for for over 600 years? So Nicodemus visits Jesus at night. You ever hear that phrase, nothing good happens after midnight? I wonder how late it was when Nick went over to visit Jesus. I'd imagine that the visit was by night so that no one would know that he was there. It was a secret meeting. Nicodemus was being very careful about revealing the nature of his questions. Because questions can be scary. Sometimes just simply asking a question can bring about more questions and then things start to change and we all know how much people love to change. As a religious leader, Nicodemus knew that his questions had weight and he needed to ask his questions in private. I think this is why deconstruction is so scary for the religious leaders of our day. Control, order, tribe, label. It keeps everyone in a controlled social order. Weak versus strong, poor versus rich, dumb versus smart. I'll be honest with you. I love theology and talking about the different ideas about God and the Bible, but after all of my years of talking to and reading some of the most educated and brilliant minds in Christianity, I know one thing. There are more things they disagree on than they agree. If we're really honest, none of us really knows how God works. I feel like the more I learn about God and live out this faith thing, the more questions I have and the more I feel like I don't really know. And I think that's a good thing. It keeps us humble. If you're here and you're listening to this program and you have big questions about God, faith, and this whole church thing, and what it all even means, I want you to know that God is big enough for your questions. We need to ask our questions because we believe here at Maison that God is actually found more in the questions than in the answers. We welcome you to ask your questions. We may not have all the answers, but we want to create a space where we can live with our questions together. So looking back at this story in John 3, Nicodemus asks his questions about seeing the kingdom of heaven and Jesus answers him by telling him, and this is my paraphrase, Forget everything you've learned about me. Forget all you think you know. Start over from the very beginning. Imagine being reborn. Entering this world with fresh eyes, a hard reboot, resetting everything. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, wake up to this new reality that I am making the way to. I think the idea of being born again has gotten so mixed up. It's so much simpler than we've made it. It's about rebirth. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter Sunday and we talked about resurrection, death, and rebirth. You see, there's a theme here. God is in the business of resurrection. Being born again is resurrection. God's plan is that everyone would go through processes of resurrection. Our lives should be a series of death-to-life experiences. 
old ways passing away and rebirth happening as our lives are refined and we mature and grow, not just in our faith and our beliefs, but in simply becoming who we're meant to be. We see the kingdom through the humility of death, dying to oneself, picking up our cross to follow Jesus in his simple way of love, peace, and grace. Many Christians use John 3.16 to evangelize, to convert unbelievers to believers, to tell them that Jesus has something that they don't already have. Yet Nicodemus was not outside the faith. He wasn't an unbeliever. In the context of this conversation, he was a leader of the faith. He would have been on par with maybe televangelists or Bible teachers of today, maybe like the late Billy Graham or Tim Keller. He was someone looked up to, admired, trusted, an authority on the faith traditions and practices. The conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus was for someone who was in the most educated, most theologically knowledgeable group. Nicodemus was at the top of the religious ladder. So Jesus is not evangelizing Nicodemus here as much as he's explaining to him a gospel that he should already recognize and understand. I heard this incredible analogy this past week where it talked about how you can know a lot about someone and you can really know someone. And those things are very, very different. Nicodemus probably knew a lot about Jesus, but this was an opportunity for him to really know Jesus. Jesus compassionately gives Nicodemus a new lens, a new perspective to view his presence. At the end of the conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus says this, All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Once again, consider the audience, not the lost, not the unbelievers. This is a message to the religious leaders, the pastors, the teachers, the people who are already in. And what does Jesus say here? He says, all who do evil, all who sow wrongdoing, hatred, all of them, including the powerful religious leaders and Pharisees, they all hate the light and refuse to move towards it. Why? Because just like film in a camera, when lights when the light hits it, it's exposed. It can never go back to being dark again. But those who do right, who do good, who desire goodness, kindness, and the other fruits of the Spirit, they come to the light so others might do the same. God is in the business of exposing darkness, not to harm us, not to out us and shame us. No, God shines light into the darkness so that all may see the truth. The truth will set you free. When we let go of our inner darkness, the hidden parts of us that we don't want to expose, God meets us with grace, love, mercy, and hope. That addiction, that struggle, that self-harm you do when no one is watching, the way our mind wanders to places we know we shouldn't go, God shines a light in the dark places. He calls us out of those shadows so that we might see ourselves whole again. We see clearly the deception of sin, and we can fully and completely turn away from it. It's freedom. When we willfully turn away from darkness and move into the light, we claim victory over our life, and we show the rest of the world that they don't have to live in those same chains any longer. We've been liberated. But those who choose to stay in the dark, this is the warning that Jesus is giving Nicodemus. A specific warning from Jesus to the religious leaders. Power wants to hold on to power. Power will almost always do whatever it takes to keep its power or expand it. We see it all the time when someone in power is caught in their sin. They deflect, they accuse, they double down. I think what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here, he's saying, hey man, be careful. Don't be blind to the harm that the Pharisees are causing because it's rooted in evil and darkness. Turn in towards the light and be set free. 
now that we have a new lens to look at these scriptures through, I think John 3.16 and the following verse 17 have a different hopeful and intentional message for us, especially for us who call ourselves Christians or followers of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Isn't that good news? If you're a part of this world, you are not condemned. If you're a part of this world, you are saved. Move away from evil and towards the light, because God has made a way for you and for me, for the believer and the unbeliever, for the sinner and the saint. Open your eyes to the new reality of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that Jesus, his heart is so big. Lord, I thank you for this conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus and how there's so much we can learn from it. I pray that you would help us to move closer to your heart through these uh, through these teachings and through through what you're trying to show us, Lord. I pray that, that we would learn to love others the way you love us, that we would turn away from evil, and that we would move towards your heart of grace and love and mercy. God, we're thankful for the work that you're doing in our lives, and we pray that you would continue to make yourself known to us through our week. We pray in your name. Amen.